hear me, so. Um, all right, so welcome to uh, the lecture on uh, supervised learning and uh, model validation. I wanted to um, briefly give some uh, small updates about the homework that's due on Wednesday. Um, so I didn't think I'd have to say this, but if something's unclear in the homework, try looking at the lecture. Like, I, I've had many questions that are related to the things that I said in the lecture, so please review the lecture if things are unclear. Also, I wanted to say, um, like, the homework might seem vague to you in some cases, but that is, uh, that is on purpose. Like, most of you are in the uh, data science master program. In the fall, you'll have a capstone project. In the capstone project, no one will tell you what to plot or what kind of plot to use. They will not tell you what model to use. They will not tell you what pre-processing to use. And like, no matter which degree you're in, most of you will probably um, be working in a company next summer. They will not give you like detailed step-by-step -step instructions. And so my goal is to um, make you be more comfortable with things that might be like slightly less explicit. So I still gave you like way more information than you would uh, and way more instructions than you would ever get. So like in two months you will get like 90% less instruction than I, you get from me now. So I realize some things are vague, but uh, there's many decisions that need to be made and I don't want to make all of these decisions for you. All right, so a very brief recap on supervised learning. Um, we already had this in the, um, in the first intro lecture. So we assume that we have um, two variables that are sampled IID from some underlying distribution, uh, X and Y. Uh, X is the description of our data, and I usually refer to those as features. Y, I, uh, y is a target. We have a collection like n sample points drawn IID from this distribution, and um, we want to learn a function so that f, uh, f so that f of x i approximately y i on the training set. But also, if I draw uh, if I draw new samples from the same distribution, the relationship will still hold. So, can generalize to a new x y drawn from distribution. I want to walk through um, one very simple example of a machine learning algorithm. So you might already be familiar with it. Um, but I want to use this as an example uh, so we can then later talk about um, model selection, model evaluation um, in this context. So the, this first example that I want you to talk about is uh, nearest neighbor classification. So this is really one of the most simple machine learning approaches you could think of. But I, I like it because it gives you like a relatively simple um, conceptual model of how machine learning approaches work in general. So assume you're giving a um, training data set um, that has uh, two features drawn on the x and the y axis here. And um, they're labeled as two diff different classes, red and blue. And you want to make a prediction for the uh, black stars they drew. So assume you're given the color point as a training set, and then you observe as new data the black stars, and you want to label them. The uh, label according to a nearest neighbor algorithm is find the nearest points in the training data set, and um, use the label of that nearest point. So for this point, the closest point was this one, which is red, so we classify this point as red. For this point, the closest point was blue, and so on. Okay, let, so let's see um, how we can apply this with scikit-learn. Uh, so, as I already mentioned um, in the introduction lecture, the starting point usually is to split our data into training and a test set, build the model on the training set, and then evaluate how well it generalizes to new unseen data on the test set. So the test set is what we pretend is our new um, sample, new, new, our new IID sample from the data distribution. Okay, so implementing this with scikit-learn is pretty straightforward. Um, there's a train test split uh, function that takes uh, your data x and your targets y. Um, so I'm not sure if I uh, already like uh, mentioned this, but basically in scikit-learn, the features and the target are always separated. 
So you always have the features in uh, capital X and um, or this is sort of a standard notation and um, Y is the target and uh, train test split uh, shuffles the data and splits it randomly in 75, 25 uh, training and test data. You can configure how it splits the data but by default it's 75, 25. Then we um, import a K neighbors algorithm um, uh, from the K neighbors module. So for classification, it's called the K neighbors classifier. Just a quick reminder. So in scikit-learn, all the um, uh, models are implemented as Python classes. So um, whenever we, uh, we want to use any machine learning or preprocessing um, step from scikit-learn, we first import the Python class. We instantiate the Python class. This is when we would set any hyperparameters. So any tuning knobs of the model. Here in this case, I set the number of neighbors to one. And then I call uh, the fit method on the training data set. So in scikit-learn, all models have a fit method um, that always gets uh, two arguments, x train, y train, at least for all the supervised models. And um, then I can evaluate the model on the test set using the score method. Uh, KNN.score computes the predictions on the test set and uh, compares them against the labels um, that are in Y test. And so by default, for all classifiers in scikit-learn, score um, produces the accuracy. So you can see here on this sort of toy data set, the accuracy on of this model was 77%. Um, uh, and uh, if we want to actually use the predictions, we can use the predict method uh, to get the labels according to the model. And so the uh, main steps are instantiating the model, fitting the model, and then either calling predict to uh, make the predictions or call score to evaluate the model on the test set. So as you, um, as you saw by me setting the parameter, there's the possibility to uh, use more than one number of neighbors. So instead of just using the closest data point in the training set, we can also use the K closest data points, which is why this is called uh, K nearest neighbor classifier. And so now here for this data point, there's uh, two uh, blue ones and one red one that are, if I set the parameter to three, they are the three closest neighbors. And I let them vote, um, which is the most frequent class. So in this case, it's blue. And so I label the new data point as blue. And so uh, which number I pick for the number of neighbors I consider has a big impact on the decisions that are made by the algorithm. So this is a very classical example of a hyperparameter of a model that is not learned from data, but that you have to specify a priori. And um, so here, just to illustrate the influence of this number of neighbors parameter in the, oh, maybe one note. I didn't construct the data set like this, but uh, it just so happens if I go from one neighbor to three neighbors, the label of all the three points flipped. So um, think about what that means for, for, the predict, for how stable the predictions are. So here I illustrated the influence of the number of neighbors on uh, this toy data set. And, but this again shows something that's very typical of uh, many machine learning algorithms. So if I look at the number of neighbors equal to one, then um, basically it represents the train data perfectly in that like around each uh, red dot, there's like an area uh, of red and around each blue dot, there's an area of blue. But the whole thing is like very zigzaggy. If I increase the number of neighbors, the, um, oh, so maybe I should say that what the colors mean. So the colors are the decision boundary. Um, what this means is that for each point in the 2D plane, I evaluate a classifier. So each point in the 2D plane serves as my a test data point. And if the classifier predicts it as uh, blue, I, label, I make the background blue. If it uh, predicts it as red, I make the background red. So all the points here uh, would be predicted as red. So if I move from one uh, neighbor to uh, five neighbors, 
um, to get uh, rid of some of the zigzags. And um, so overall, it looks like maybe a little bit simpler. Um, but you can see that some of the training data points are misclassified. For example, this one and this one and this one. And um, if you increase the number of uh, neighbors, you get something that becomes sort of more and more just like a horizontal line and captures less and less of the detail of um, the training data set. In a sense, it becomes sort of simpler, but it also misclassifies the training set more. Again, this is a, a very typical um, example. So I made a plot of what this looks like on this data set. It's a very noisy plot because it's like 100 samples or something. But what you can see is that um, if you look at a single a neighbor, then basically uh, the predictions on the training set are perfect because like each point is, is its own neighbor. If you increase the number of neighbors, however, it sort of goes down. So the blue line kind of goes down if you increase the number of neighbors. Whereas um, on the test set, the, uh, if you have sort of a low number of neighbors, it's not so good. If you th then increase the number of neighbors, it gets better. Around 20, it's best. And then sort of it decreases again. And I said this is sort of a toy data set and a very small noisy example. But these are trends that you can actually see in basically all machine learning models. All machine learning models have some uh, hyperparameters that you can tune to change the complexity of the model. So here, uh, in terms of what they can learn, actually having few neighbors means a more complex model. Having few neighbors means remembering very exactly what um, the training set looked like. Whereas if you consider more neighbors, you more get like a rough outline uh, of the data set. So it would uh, correspond to a less complex model. And so, as I said, basically all machine learning, model, uh, machine learning models have these kind of hyperparameters. If you look at gradient boosting, random forest, neural networks, SVMs, um, logistic regression, basically all of them have some way to tune the model complexity. And what you will always see is that as you increase the model complexity, um, the accuracy on the training set gets better and better. Because you allow the model more and more flexibility, you allow it to fit the da training data set better and better. However, if you look at an independent test set at generalization performance, what you will see is that if the model is too simple, it will do quite badly. Then it's, if you increase model complexity, um, the model performance increases, but then at some point um, it turns and the generalization performance actually decreases. This is what is known as overfitting. Overfitting basically means that the model learns things about the training data that don't generalize to new unseen data. So that basically means you, you pick the model that is too complex for the task. So what you can also see here is that as you allow the model to be more and more complex, usually the gap between uh, the training and generalization performance widens. And so looking at the gap between training and generalization performance is actually a good way to um, figure out in which regime you are. If there's a very big gap between the two, you might be overfitting. If they are very close together, you might be more in an underfitting regime. There's not really... Um, an exact way to specify this, but uh, we'll talk about this in a second, but usually what you do is you um, determine what are the parameters that determine model complexity, and you um, search over the different values of the model complexity, and then find the sweet spot that gives you best generalization performance. And yeah, so we'll, um, we'll come back to this in like m nearly every lecture for most of the, uh, the first half of the semester when uh, for all the different models, we'll talk about what does the model complexity look like for a specific model. <laughs>
Um, coming briefly back to nearest neighbor. So the nearest neighbor approach, I mostly uh, think it's interesting in like an educational setting because it's very easy to understand and has this very clear parameter that allows you to control model complexity. Um, it, it's sometimes actually good in practice, but I briefly want to talk about the computational properties uh, of this model. So one thing that's nice about it is that fitting takes no time. You just remember all the data. However, the memory um, is, space is pretty big. You have to store the whole data set. So if you want to deploy a model, you have to basically store the whole data set. What's also pretty bad is that um, the prediction time for a single sample is the size of the data set. So because you have to, if you have, get a new test data point, you basically have to compute the distance to each training data point. So if you have a very big training data set, prediction gets very slow. This is why people don't use this if they have a lot of data, because it will just take too long. But if you have like hundreds or thousands of samples, maybe this is, still makes sense. Um, and so there's like different approaches that you can use to speed this up. One of them is KD trees or bulk trees. These are um, data structures you could use to um, actually do some work during fitting and uh, pre-compute uh, data structure that allows you to query distances more quickly. So then you spend some time during fitting and uh, uh, as a trade-off, you get faster predictions. And so that, but it only really works in low dimensions. So you get a speed up that is huge from n times p uh, to, sorry, to uh, k times log n. So that it doesn't have p in it anymore because the, um, but the dependency on p is exponential. So basically, if you're in three dimensions or in five dimensions, they work, this works really great. If you work in 700 dimensions, uh, ball trees and KD trees don't really, uh, don't really speed it up. Scikit-learn so actually automatically um, determines whether to use the one on the left or the one on the right, depending on how many samples and features you have. Anyway, that's just as a side note. So this is not really something, because of the uh, scalability issues to many samples, it's not something that uh, people usually use a lot these days. Okay. So, so far I talked about having um, your data split into a training and a de test set and um, building your model on a training set and evaluating it on a test set. So let's say we want to um, now find what is the best parameter for a number of neighbors in uh, K neighbors classification. Um, like the simplest way to do this is uh, for each number of neighbors that I care about, let's say I want to try one, three, five, ten, 10, uh, and 100 or something like this. I built a model on the training set and I evaluate it on the test set. And then I can, for each, um, for each setting of the parameters, I can evaluate how well will it do on a test set. And that's a good strategy for optimizing um, K, the parameter that I'm interested in. However, if I want to know how well the model actually does, I cannot do this anymore. If I, and I'll illustrate why in a second. Having a, a split into training and test set either allows me to evaluate a single model or it allows me to pick among uh, several models, but it doesn't allow me to do both. So what people usually do or often do is do a split into training, validation, and test set. So you split the data into three parts. Um, and so, now you build, use a training set for uh, building a model, a validation set to pick what is the best setting of the parameters, and a test set to evaluate how well does the model do. And ideally, you would use the test set exactly once in the end. 
And uh, there's actually there's like an interesting paper from 97 by Andrew Ng, who's now way more famous than he was then, um, <laughs> on preventing overfitting and cross-validation, if you want to read a really old paper about this. But I wanted to, I'm going to try to illustrate this point with an example. So let's look at this sort of cartoonish curve that I made up. That is, well, we have a hyperparameter, and as you increase the complexity of the model, you get better and better on training set. And um, let's say, assuming we have, we know, we, we have like infinitely many samples, uh, we could figure out how well does it actually generalize. However, if um, we, we don't have infinitely many samples, we have usually like a relatively small like um, test or validation set. So if I measure how well I generalize with my validation set, it's going to be a quite noisy measurement. So now I have this noisy measurement of um, what the generalization performance actually will be. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to pick the uh, maximum performance. I want to find out which hyperparameter gives me the best performance. It's this guy. And so if I now look at what is the performance on this validation set, I'm going to be way optimistic. I had a noisy measurement and I computed the maximum over the noisy measurement. And this maximum will always be like at the max of the noise, right? So this actually, the red point, the maximum, gives me a pretty good um, placement on where I should be on the x-axis. So here, this hyperparameter is probably not very far from the optimum. Maybe the optimum is here, but it seems like pretty good. But how well it says I'm doing is much overestimated. This is why we need a separate test set. So if I independently draw a test set, the test set will also be a noisy measurement of the generalization performance. But if, because it's independent, uh, it will give me an unbiased estimate again. By computing the maximum on the validation set, it's not an unbiased estimate, but if I have an independent set, I can do an unbiased estimate of this one model that I looked at, and this will give me a much more realistic estimate of how well I generalize. And so the, basically the red point tells me what's the good hyperparameter, and basically I put the maximum over my whole parameter sweep, but at the test set I look exactly at one parameter setting, and uh, this will give me an unbiased estimate of how well I can be in the future. Of how well I can do in the future. All right, so I hope this sort of drove the, the point home about why you need uh, two, two sets. I want to um, briefly show you like an implementation of what this would look like. So this is um, probably uh, like you don't actually have to implement this yourself because scikit-learn does most of the work for you. But let's say I want to implement this uh, from scratch just to see what's happening. So I call train test split twice. And um, so I split once into training validation set and test set. And then I split the train validation set into training and validation. It's like maybe a little bit weird way to split it into three, par three parts, but that's what I did. What I need to do is first define a range of what are the, uh, the range of parameters I want to search over, and obviously what is the parameter. So here the parameter of interest is the number of neighbors, and um, I have to come up with some range. This is actually kind of tricky because, um, I mean, how do you come up with this range? You can look at the scikit-learn documentation and hopefully it'll give you some guidance. Or you can look at my book and hopefully it gives you some guidance. Or maybe you can look at this course and hopefully it will give you some guidance. Uh, we're not actually going to talk about the um, um, k-neighbors classifier that much because it's not that commonly uh, used. But uh, for all the other models, basically whenever we discuss a model, we're going to talk about how do you actually pick these ranges. Um, all right, and so then, for all of the candidates, oh. Sorry, I just wanted to ask, uh, how, does, uh, how does train test split decide the proportion? And if you split it first and then you split it again, will the validation and the test set be different sizes? Um, OK, the question is, how does it decide the proportions? There's a parameter, the default is uh, 75, 25. And yes, now the 
the way I did it, the validation set will be smaller than the test set. And I mean, that's probably fine, but um, you, you could also say you, you don't want this and then you can specify it in a different way. But yeah, you, you read that correctly. Um, all right. Um, okay, so we iterate over all the values of the parameter we care about. Uh, we call fit, and then we call score on the validation set. And um, then we append the score to sort of we record it. Uh, I, I thought I changed this to f strings, but whatever. Um, so then I could look at what is the maximum of the validation scores after I did this for all of the uh, value of the hyperparameter. The maximum score I get on the um, validation set is 0.99 accuracy and the best number of neighbors. Um, so the arc max is um, 11. And now I can um, evaluate this hyperparameter on the independent test set. Um, so I built a new model with the number of neighbors being the best number of neighbors. I could also um, use the model we built before, but instead what I'm going to do is I will fit a new model on both the training and the validation set together. So this way I maximize my use of the data. And uh, then I evaluate it on the test set. So, and this is sort of how you would, this is sort of the simplest way how you can uh, tune hyperparameters and evaluate the model. Or let's say the simplest way would be without refitting. This way is actually used quite a lot in neural networks where you have a split into three parts. Uh, we'll look at more uh, sophisticated methods in a second, but um, so without the refitting part, this is used in neural networks because it's like the fastest way you could do anything. Because fitting neural networks takes forever and you don't want to do anything that increases training time. Also for neural networks, data sizes are usually very big and the bigger the data set, um, the less sort of it matters um, whether you like add the validation set or the, the less it matters how you split the data in the training and test set. All right, so this is sort of a very simple method, having just three different sets. It's very fast, but um, it also, like in general, unless your data set is very big, it depends a lot on how you split the data into training test set. If you split it differently, you might get different results. And so, um, a sort of more sophisticated but more expensive strategy is to use cross-validation. In cross-validation, um, you pick a number k, that's usually 5 or 10. You split your data into, say, five poles of equal size. Um, you declare the first one, the first part of the data as a test set, and you train on the remaining four. Then you declare the, uh, the second one, uh, the test set, and train on the remaining four, and so on. So here, in, for five-fold cross-validation, we would train five models. And um, for, for each of these models, we could evaluate it on the test set or sort of on the, on the test part and uh, record a score. Then in the end, we can compute the mean of these scores or the median or whatever strategy you want. This is more robust because um, it, doesn't, it depends less on how you split the data set. In particular, each data point is in the test set exactly once. So if you look at the row on data, the row, any row in the data will be in one of the test sets. So this is uh, more stable. It might be, allow you to use more data uh, during training, but it's much slower. In this case, it's about five times slower. If you do tenfold, it's about 10 times slower. This is the reason why people in neural networks don't usually do this because um, if you're already training for three days, you don't want to, want to wait 15 days instead. So this basically replaces one of the splits. So this is usually the split into training and validation set is replaced with cross-validation. So you take your whole data set, you split it into a training set and a test set for final evaluation. On the training set, you use cross-validation 
you use that to find the parameters. And then on a test data set, you do a final evaluation. And again, usually you want to do the uh, look at the test data set basically only once. So you can use cross-validation or training set to tune the parameters, but also do model comparison. Say, do I want to use a linear model or do I want to use gradient boosting or do I want to use neural networks? Um, you do all of this uh, using cross-validation on the training data set. And then um, once you settle on the model, you want to find out how well will this model perform in the future, then you use the test data. Here is the same code I showed before, but now instead of using a train test split, using cross-validation. So as I did before, I split the data set into a training and test set using training test split, and I imported the cross-val score function. The cross-val score just computes the cross-validated score uh, and does cross-validation for you. And we'll just return a list of scores, in this case accuracy, for each of the splits. Then again, I iterate over the number of neighbors that I have to pick. Then for each number of neighbor that I care about, I call now cross file score with the model I want to evaluate, the training data, the training labels, and then I can specify CV. Say so here I say use tenfold cross validation. And then in this case, I'm using the mean to aggregate the score, so I append uh, the mean. Um, then again, I can compute the mean, uh, the maximum of these means. Yeah. How do you decide the CV, the best change of the cross-validation? Questions: How do I define what is the best k and k-fold cross-validation? Uh, usually it's five or ten, but I'll give you many more options, more than you ever want later on. But um, like it's basically ten is I think generally is of is better, but is twice as expensive as five. Five is usually good enough, and yeah, I'll talk more about it later. Um, I think five is like very common practice. Ah, we don't no, we're not using fit. Cross val score calls fit internally ten times for the ten different splits of the data set. And cross val score doesn't return a model, it returns just the scores. Then I decide with my argmax what is the best mean score, um, which is 0.96. The best number of neighbors is nine. And then again I retrain um, a new model. So now I call fit on the training data set with the best number of neighbors that I found. This will give me the, a new model with the best number of neighbors, and I can evaluate it on the test set. That was a question? Yes, I just want to ensure, what is the complexity in KM model so that higher N neighbors is uh, more com complex or less complex? Sorry, um, I mean, more neighbors yes. means it means less complexity okay. in a sense. So you can you can sort of see this. I mean, depends on like I didn't define complexity, and there's several like you could, things you could talk about. But basically, if you look at these pictures, the one on the left looks complicated. The one on the bottom right looks less complicated. That is sort of. You can also compute like, and I think the VC dimension is in, in, in the, uh, infinite for both of them. I don't know. There's like there's formal theory measures that you could use but I don't want to go into that too much. I just sort of think of a vague concept of how well you can fit the training data set. Um, sorry. Other questions? All right. Um, just to summarize, so um, the way this um, model selection workflow usually works is you start with your data set, and you start with your, so I say here parameters, but I mean hyperparameters. I'm sometimes a bit vague which one I say, but usually when I mean say parameters, I mean hyperparameters. So these are not things you learn from the data, but things that you have to specify a priori. This might also include which model I want to use or which preprocessing I want to use or any choice in the modeling. I split the data into training and test set. And then I use cross-validation on the training data set. Um, 
to pick the best hyperparameters and pick the best model or pick the best preprocessing, pick whatever I want. And then uh, once I have these, my best model with the best hyperparameters, I retrain it on the whole train data set. I can also, um, and then I can use the retrained model on the test data set for a final evaluation. And that will tell me how well will the model do in the future. So this part here, the cross validation tells you which model to use and the final evaluation will tell you how good is it. Because of course your boss will always ask you how accurate is it. If you tell them the maximum from the cross validation, then you're telling them the wrong thing. So this is a very common workflow and you can easily do this with scikit-learn so you don't actually have to implement it yourself. There's a thing in scikit-learn called grid search CV, which stands for grid search with cross validation. So grid search basically means a brute force parameter search. It has an exhaustive search over the parameters uh, that you provide. And the way you use it is you specify the parameters you want to search over as a Python dictionary, where the keys are the names of the parameters you want to search over. So in this case, the number of neighbors and uh, the values are the different values you want to try. So here I have numbers from 1 to 15, all the uh, uneven ones. So it's actually 1 to 13. Then I specify my grid search object. So again, this, is, this model is, um, or, so this functionality is implemented as a Python class. So we call up these Python classes estimators in scikit-learn because they all have the same, same interface. Um, I, I give it the model I want to uh, tune, which is KNABRS classifier, the parameter grid, uh, and how I want to do cross-validation. So in this case, CV equal to 10 for 10-fold cross-validation. I also tell it to return the training score so I can do uh, more debugging. Okay, fun fact, we added this parameter. So by default, we used to uh, always compute the training score. Um, Someone did this uh, uh, with k -nearest neighbors. k -nearest neighbors is super slow to predict. If your training data set is really big and you predict the error on the training data set, it'll take forever. And so someone really complained about this and so now we don't compute training scores uh, by default anymore and you have to say actually compute them. But it's related to how slow k -nearest classifier is to predict. Um, yeah, anyway, so, and then you can call fit. So grid search CV is what we call a meta estimator in that it takes a model, the k -name is classifier, and it creates a new model. The new model is a wrapper that does the cross validation grid search for you. But once you did the wrapping, you can just use it like any other model. So you can call fit or predict or score. So you don't really need to know that grid in inside does the grid search for you. If you want, you can inspect some parts of it like what is the best uh, cross-validation score or what's the best parameters by looking at these attributes, grid.best score and grid.best params. And then in the end, you can evaluate it on the test set. Maybe another note on scikit-learn uh, conventions. So you can see here the score and the best params end with a trailing underscore. In scikit-learn, anything that's estimated from data ends with a trailing underscore. So if you look at like the trees in a forest or if you look at the coefficients in logistic reg regression, they will always end with an underscore. Whereas the things that you specify in the constructor, they don't have an underscore. Oh, you, but basically once you identify the parameters, you can just use them, right? You don't, unless you change something in your training procedure or you change the data, you don't really need to, need to do this again. So, I mean, this is a, in a sense, this is a lengthy procedure because um, here I specified, oh my God, six, six different values. It does tenfold cross-validation for each of them. So this will train 60 models. Uh, do I have a, wait. Uh, I don't have an example, but if you have two hyperparameters, it will try out all the, configure, all the combinations. Um, so if you have 10 choices, one hyperparameter, 10 for the other, and you have 10 fold cross validation, you will uh, train a thousand models. So don't do this too often. <laughs> 
Um, the question is, how does Gritzer CV split the, uh, the um, data internally? And yes, so it splits it the same way for each of the number of neighbors. Yeah, there's no, um, basically the, the splitting is paired across all the parameters. But this, how you do the splitting there is independent of how you did the splitting earlier, right? Yeah, you can also, there's like a thing called uh, CV results, again, with an underscore at the end, um, that gives you like a lot of information. In this case, so the easiest thing is to convert it to a data frame, then you can plot, for example, here, the mean train and mean test score. I'm not sure if this is on the same toy data set or a slightly different toy data set, it doesn't really matter too much, but the main uh, thing is that basically you can look at this CV results and you can, uh, from there, see um, like, did it make any difference? Here, for example, you can see that um, there's a lot of noise in the test scores, so it's a little bit, and they're like sort of the same everywhere. Or like there's not big differences. It's very useful to look both at a training and a test scores, I think, for, um, for parameter tuning, because then you can see uh, whether the ranges you picked are useful. Uh, is there any variation over the ranges? And also, like, if the optimum is at a corner of the range, maybe you should expand the range, or maybe you can shrink the range and concentrate on an area or something like this. So it's always good to like look at the result of your cross validation, sorry, of your grid search. Um, you can also so this, yeah. So the question is, um, if you don't do this with neural networks, so what, what else do you do? And I think basically the um, people just use a validation set and it's sort of assume that the, if the data set is big enough, then you're not introducing too much bias. Um, if you search over a very big space of different hyperparameters, um, there's sort of better ways than brute force search, but Generally, all of them are still evaluated just using a validation set. It's um, one standard error over the uh, the folds. So we have ten repetitions. Um, so we have ten accuracy values for each of the parameters. Okay, so this, so we use cross validation instead of the inner split into training validation fold. We can also replace the outer split. That's called nested cross validation. Um, so then you would do an outer cross validation loop. And then inside that, you'd have parameter model tuning. And inside that, you would have another cross validation loop. Um, that doesn't yield a single model because like the inner loop might find different optima for each of the outer splits and it takes a really long time. Um, so I say it's not that useful in practice. Uh, then I, I later realized that actually um, one of my colleagues, Gael Verroco, is pretty much in favor of doing this. I think it's because he works on data sets where he has very few samples. So um, basically if if I do tenfold outer and tenfold inner cross validation, uh, each hyperparameter I try results in 100 models being built. Um, so very often you can't really afford that or want to afford that. Uh, but if you have uh, smaller data sets, it might be worth, that, worth uh, doing that for added robustness. So you don't really get a single model or a single hyperparameter set if you do that. Um, so instead of um, retraining the best parameter set, what you can do is like, um, in each of the outer loops, you build a model and you can ensemble and average all of the models. Um, and I might expand and, 
like later in a class on this. But it's definitely like you, you can do it, but I haven't seen it that much in practice. And so the having a single test set is something that I see much more commonly. Um, so now I want to talk a little bit more about the different um, strategies for cross-validation and data splitting. So what we saw so far is um, k-fold cross-validation. k-fold basically just um, splits the data into, uh, into k parts. And usually, like, so in scikit-learn, by default, it doesn't shuffle the data. If you do train test split before, you, it shuffles the data beforehand. But um, the k-fold itself doesn't shuffle, and so it just splits it um, by index. So the first couple of, the first, like, 25% um, will be your first, the first 20% will be your first split, uh, first uh, test set, the next 20% um, will be your, be your second test set, and so on. Um, if your data is ordered and you didn't shuffle it, clearly that's very bad. So assume you have like three classes in your data set. So assume like you have the sample index here and the y-axis and you have like these three different classes. If you just naively use k-fold, it's gonna be very bad if the data is ordered because um, like each test set basically only contains a cl one class. And like here in the fifth split, the class that's in the test set has never been seen in a training set. So in this case, like Shuffling would obviously fix that issue. Um, so if your data is ordered, make sure to shuffle it. However, there can be other issues. Um, if the classes are imbalanced, you might want to keep the imbalance of the classes in each split. You can do this with uh, stratified k-fold. In stratified k-fold, um, Again, you split into say five disjoint parts and you do the same game as in k-fold, but you ensure that for each um, fold, so for each test set that you create, the ratio between the classes is the same as in the overall data set. And so one easy way to, do it, to ensure this, for example, is like take the first 20% of the first class, the first 20% of the second class, the first 20% of the third class, um, for your first split. This will give you um, more robust estimates, um, at least for uh, several different metrics. And it's basically, it's never bad to do this. So it's like you learn does this by default for classification. Here is sort of um, a very small sort of uh, synthetic example that, in which I try to convince you that this is a good idea. So let's say we have a very small data set which has uh, 60 points of class 0 and 40 points of class 1. If I just use a dummy classifier, dummy classifier in scikit-learn is something that either makes constant or random predictions, and I tell it just always predict the most frequent class, Um, oh, then, if I want to co more control over cross-validation, um, there's these cross-validation classes in SKLR model selection, for example, for k-fold and stratified k-fold. And so I can construct these objects, you can look at the documentation for all the amazing options, and um, then instead of passing CV equal to a number, I can pass CV equal to this cross-validation object. And so let's say I have this data set. So what the actual data is doesn't matter because I use the dummy classifier, which is always predicts the most frequent class. And if I do cross-validation with stratified k-fold, it tells me it's gonna be 60% accurate. And the standard deviation during cross-validation is zero because it's gonna be 60% accurate on each of the splits because the splits are uh, even among the classes. However, if I look at um, standard k-fold, then you can see that there's like much more uncertainty. Um, so there's like a standard deviation of um, 0.06 between the different cross-validation folds. So even though the model, 
always predicts zero. So here, basically, I gave a model that always predicts zero, but if I run cross-validation on it, it, it gives me um, a difference between the different test sets. And okay, maybe there's sort of um, okay, there's philosophical reasons why some people might prefer the bottom one, but I think in practice, um, using stratified k fault um, will usually just give you more stable results. So the, the philosophical reason is that someone could, could, uh, could argue that if you get a new test set, it's very unlikely that the test set will have exactly 60% uh, zeros, and so having no standard deviation is a bad estimate. But anyway, so this was just an example to show you the difference between the two. So assume, now let's assume you want to have even better um, estimates so let's say, oh, this tenfold cross-validation is really going much too quickly. I really want to spend, take, uh, want it to take longer. Then um, there's two uh, ways to basically get better uncertainty estimates and get more robust estimates. One of them is called repeated k-fold, and the other one is leave one out. Oh, actually, there's three: leave one out, shuffle split, and repeated k-fold. So leave one out, basically. The idea here is to just approach the number of, of folds that you do to the, set it to the maximum, which is the number of samples. Um, so this means you, you hold out one sample at a time, which takes super long. So if you had a thousand samples, you would have a thousand times cross validation. If you have 10,000 samples, you would do 10,000 fold cross validation. Not only does it take a long time, it's actually also a bad idea. Um, and so, yeah, my, my friend Galvao Co like did an empirical study of this for neuroscience, but there's been like a ton of literature. And I don't know if you know S Sebastian Raspska. He also wrote a cool book about, on like Python machine learning. Uh, he did like a review paper on why this is a bad idea, and cited all the people that tell you why this is a bad idea. So even if you had infinite compute, don't do this. Um, there's better ways to do this. One of them is um, what's called shuffle split in scikit-learn. It's also known as Monte Carlo, um, uh, where you randomly pick subsets uh, and you r randomly sample a test set with replacement. And I'll give you an illustration of this in a second. And even better is, I think, repeated k-fold, where you repeatedly shuffle the data and then, then write either k-fold or stratified k-fold. Hopefully by now you have uh, figured out what I mean by these graphs and uh, can, can read this. So in shuffle split, really, I can, I can independently control the number of iterations and the test set size. And so let's say, here I said I want eight iterations and my test set should be 10%. So then in each iteration, it'll randomly sample 10% of the data and um, put this in a test set. Uh, you can also actually, in, if you want to use scikit-learn, you can use this to produce a single split into a test and validation set by just set number of iterations to one. If you set number of iterations to one, you get a single split to train test set. That's random. Um, so this is great because you can like make your validation set be like 10 or 20 percent and then run a million iterations if you have too much time and you want a very good estimate. Um, the sort of, so this is a good method. The sort of only issue you can have with it is that you get a lot of un, like uncertainty because um, the times that a sample might appear in test set might be very different. So if you look at the guy that's like very at the very top, so let's say this is like our first or maybe our last sample, this is in um, four out of the eight uh, test sets, which is sort of on average, you would expect it to be in, oh my God, 0.8, is that correct? So you'd expect it to be in one of them, but it's in many of them. And so this sort of uh, creates uh, another factor of variation. Um, if you do repeated k-fold or repeated stratified k-fold, 
you kind of eliminate this um, variation because you do, here in this case, I do three times five-fold cross-validation. So the first five splits are just stratified k-fold. And so in the first five splits, each data point is in the test set exactly once because that's how k-fold works. Then I shuffle the data and I split it into five folds uh, again, and I have five more iterations. And again, um, each point in the test set exactly once. And so if I do three times five fold, each point is in the test set three times. And so um, again, if you have like a lot of time or your data set is small and you want a very robust estimate, this is probably a good way to get a robust estimate. And so people rarely do like do more than five times five fold or 10 times 10 fold. So 10 times 10 fold would be 100 iterations. That's like more than you ever need. But if you really like, if you want to like have very robust cross validation, use that one. Um, very briefly, um, a repetition of some of the defaults in scikit-learn. So starting 0 0.22, which is the current uh, version of scikit-learn, I think we put it out in November, um, five-fold cross-validation is the default. Before that, it was three-fold. Don't use three-fold, it's two little folds. Uh, so you either use five or 10. So if you use all versions of scikit-learn, make sure to specify five and don't use the default of three. If you use cross valid score or grid, grid search CV, then the cross validation is stratified by default. <coughs> Wait. Um, and um, so, but if you do train test split, it will not stratify by default because it doesn't know about stratification and like. Please don't ask me about it. But if you want to stratify and train test split, there's a stratify option. And so if you set stratify equal to Y, it will stratify according to the classes in Y and train test split. And there's going to be no shuffling by default. Train test split shuffles, but kfold and stratify kfold and all of these don't shuffle by default, but you can make them shuffle. So if, if you call cross val score with the default five times, it will give you five times the same result. So don't do that. Uh, for stratified sampling, if you stratify on X, and X is very high dimensional, can it handle that within reason, or is it meant to just stratify on one feature or one element? Stratify right now only works with classes, so they need to be discrete. So you couldn't stratify on a discrete feature. I'm not sure, it's probably not a good idea to do that. Um, but can you stratify on like, if you have like 10 discrete features? No. Can, okay. I mean, you could do the, but I think also it's a bad idea because then you can't really learn from that feature, right? If you stratify. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk about something related soon, meaning in two slides, but um, but yeah, generally, you can also not do this for regression problems right now. I have a pull request to add this for regression problems, but I, I had to work on making slides or something. So it's kind of stalled. Um, cool. So, so this is sort of standard cross-validation. Um, there's a couple of important caveats. So I said at the very beginning in supervised learning, we always assume our data is drawn IID from some unknown distribution, and cross-validation also assumes that. In particular, shuffling your data and randomly picking training test sets assume that. However, your data is never actually IID. And in uh, validating your models, that's actually an important thing to take into consideration. One pretty common example is group data. So assume you have data, so let's say medical data or user data or product data, or whatever you can think of, from five different cities. Let's say you have data from New York, San Francisco, Los Angeles, Chicago, and uh, Houston. And so you have a data set, and it comes from these different cities, and you put them all together in a big data frame. You can assume that 
within each city, things are more homogeneous. Or like if you have medical records, things within a particular hospital will be more homogeneous. And um, so there's now two different usage scenarios you can think of for this data. The IID setting is that um, all future users or all future patients or whatever you're studying comes from the, uh, from the same cities and will be generated IID. This is sort of the standard assumption. However, very often that's not true. Very often what you care about is, well, we're going to launch this product in a new city now and I want to know how well will it do in a new city. If you want to do th that, then this is not then you have to think about the group data uh, structure of the data and have to treat it as non-IID data. Um, similarly, you can think of things like, assume you have multiple measurements for a patient in a hospital or multiple measurements for the same user. Usually, you care about um, predicting things for a new patient or a new user. Whereas, if you leave out data at random, um, some of the measurements from a user might be both in a training and a test set. It will make it much, much easier to predict. So if you're in an IID scenario, so basically you should think about what do I want out of this evaluation? Do I want to know how well I will generalize within these five cities or do I want to know how well I will generalize to a new city? If I want to generalize within what I currently know basically, then um, uh, I can do wh what we talked about so far. If we want to generalize to a new city, um, you need to use non-ID cross-validation. For group data, there's a uh, group k-fold and um, certified, no, there's no certified group k-fold, sorry. Just group k-fold. And so you have some side information, say here the group, and so you want to make sure that anytime you split the data, each group will be either entirely in the training set or entirely in a test set. So let's say if you want to evaluate your model on the New York users, you don't want to have any New York users in a training set because you want to know the data from all the other cities. Does it generalize well enough so I can predict the New York users? Because that will tell me whether if I get a new city, will I be able to work on a new city? And so, um, so group is not a feature here really because um, the value for group you'll get in the future will be a distinct value and so you couldn't really learn about. So this is sort of a side information that you have about the correlation structure of the data. And so um, all the cross-validation things in scikit-learn also have, have a group parameter and all of them ignore the group parameter except for one that's called group k-fold. And I think there's also repeated group k-fold and maybe group shuffle split. There's some with group in them. Yeah? Why do they just train like separate models for each city? Because you want to generalize for a new, to a new city. Let's say you want to launch, you, you have like Say you have 10 cities in which you all launch your parking of user data. You want to launch an 11th city, you have no data for the 11th city. So you want to see, is the data that I collected in the other cities good enough to cover the thing in a new city? Will it allow me to generalize to a new place? Or like, if a new guy walks into my hospital, will I be able to make predictions for the new guy, not just for all the people that I've been monitoring for <coughs> three years? And that's like often an important question. Sorry. Does that make sense? So like if the New York group was all the same class and no other city would have that same class, it would still work? Um, so the question is, if basically the group in the class was the same, would this still work? And like, I don't know, no model could learn this, right? Because you can't predict, like if your training data set doesn't have the New York class and New York is the, the class you want to predict, there's no way. So like you need to observe a class in the training data set if you want to predict it. Um, yeah, so a similar problem to this, that's maybe something that people think have thought a, lot, a little bit more is like, 
if your correlations in the ter uh, in the form of time. The same thing can be true also for space. Basically, think about any kind of correlation structure your data might have. So time is a very obvious one. And even if your data doesn't really come to you as a time series, most data has a time component because the data didn't like magically appear like at one second. Data usually is collected over a time span. And so here, this is uh, a time series of presidential approval estimates. That should be much lower, hopefully, but whatever. And <laughs> anyway, so, um, so assume like we have any features, uh, like maybe we just have the time or we have some features of social media or um, whatever the New York Times wrote or something, but um, just don't think about the features too much. But assume now I split this data set into training and test set randomly. So if I hold out 10% at random, I'll hold out, hold out like these bits. If I now have, if I have something describing what's happening here, and I have something that's describing what's happening here, it's very easy to figure out what's happening here. And so if you disregard, like if you shuffle data and you try to predict Time series, like basically, you will always have a perfect model in time series analysis because the stuff is so correlated over time and you just ignore the correlation structure. It's kind of obvious if you plot it like this, but uh, many data sets have this structure in an obvious way. And so the obvious thing you want to do is um, structure the test set according to the correlation in your data. So usually, um, so you want to take out a chunk of the time series. Usually you care about predicting the future from the past, so you want to take some data set as a training set and then something that's in the future of that as a test set. As I said, the same applies to like um, geospatial data. If you have um, data about neighborhoods in New York, like if you have data about one neighborhood, well, in a training set, then predicting the one right next to it in a test set will be very easy. But if you split it, like taking spatial um, uh, closeness into account, the problem will become much harder. I actually have seen this in um, in like a thing I reviewed for Nature, basically where someone did like prediction on um, ocean health data. And they did prediction on ocean health data based on sensor measurements from like their ships going around and satellites and so on, but they shuffle the data. But there's an obvious correlation structure. Like if, you, if your ship measured here and you have this new train data set and then you have something here in your test data set, the result will be the same. Your model can just memorize the data and will do perfectly. Um, so be aware of correlation structure in your data when you split the data. And that's not only true for cross-validation. Obviously, it's also true if you just do a single train test split. And how does it apply to the case of uh, local proximity costs? Um, how well, you would, you, you, well, the point is like, if you want to sort of see how much you can generalize across proximity, you could do is like group them by borough or something, or like, one approach for geospatial data I saw was like, you take big chunks that's like one longitude by one latitude or something, and then it depends on your application whether the chunk is big enough to leave out. Okay, I have to unfortunately speed up a little bit. Oh, but I don't have that much anymore. So um, for time series analysis, there's something also in scikit-learn called uh, time series split. Um, there's also, uh, we, you again, give it a number of uh, splits. Here I gave it five. And um, you also give it a maximum training size. So here I give it a maximum training size of 20. And then you get something that's more like a rolling window. So here you always take um, some part of the data set as training data, and then something that's in the future of that as a test data. And then you um, iterate over different parts of the sliding window. If you don't set the max train size, um, what it will do, it will just grow the training set. So, I mean, they are ordered in a different way, but basically you can think of it as starting with like, let's say I start with the first month of my data being a training set and I test on the second month. Then I, start, then I train on the first and the second month and I test on the third month. 
and so on. So I can do this either with a growing training set size or I can do this with like a rolling window kind of thing. But in any case, you want to make sure that sort of the training data set is the past of the test data set and not that they're randomly split. Um, okay, I already showed you how to do this. So basically for each of them, the time series, the group one, the shuffle split, anything, there's objects in scikit-learn. You can instantiate the objects. They have many, many different um, options and then you can pass that instead of the CV. And you can see here for the K five volt, I get just five values for the repeated stratified, I did five times, 10 times five folds, so I will get 50 values out. Um, maybe lastly, there's another function to doing cross validation in scikit-learn that's called cross validate. So cross val score only returns a list of the test scores. Cross validate returns a dictionary that has a test score, um, optionally training score, training time, scoring time, and you can compute multiple scores at once. So here, for example, I used cross validate instead of cross valid score, and I computed train and test accuracy, and I computed accuracy and ROC. And so if you want more details, you can use cross validate, and it gives you more structure than just cross valid score. All right, um, any other questions for today? All right, then uh, see you Wednesday. I'm actually here Wednesday.